Thank you so much for being here. I'm Darren Davis, and it's my great honor to serve Baylor as Vice President for University Mission and also as Director of the Institute for Faith and Learning. One of the events convened by IFL and since 2014 is the Bill and Roberta Bailey Family Lecture in Christian Ethics. And before I uh, introduce um, my colleague Jason Witt to make introduction of our speaker, I wanted to set this lecture and the family who it's named for in a bit of context for us. The Bill and Roberta Bailey family is one that is marked uh, by deep commitment, deep commitment to their faith, deep commitment to Baylor University, and deep commitment to Waco. Bill and Roberta uh, were both born in Waco, and uh, they were both, both graduates of Waco High School. They met one another when Bill was 15 years old and Roberta was 14 years old, and they were married almost 64 years. They were both graduates of Baylor University. Roberta earned a degree in English and then a master's degree. Bill earned an undergraduate degree and then a law degree and had a long and distinguished career in insurance and risk management. They, theirs was a life and a family of service. Bill served in the United States Air Force. Each of them served uh, the city of Waco and uh, civic engagement in various ways for Hillcrest Hospital, the United Way, Camp Fire, Junior League. They were members of First Baptist Church of Waco. In fact, uh, Roberta was a lifelong member of the church. And they loved Baylor University. They were supporters of academic scholarships and initiatives across the university, including athletics. Bill served on the board of trustees and later on the board of regents for a total of 18 years. That's a remarkable tenure to serve on a board. Roberta died in 2014 and Bill died in 2015. They loved their family. They loved their friends. They have three wonderful sons, Roy, Wes, and Hatch. Wes and Hatch both live here in town. They both send their regrets that they couldn't be here. The Bailey family also had 10 grandchildren and scores of great grandchildren and dear friends. In 2014, we established in the Institute for Faith and Learning this lecture series that we hope would model and exemplify and hold up the idea that the Christian tradi tradition and its moral tradition in particular ought to be explored and examined and um, held forth at Baylor in a particular way. And we couldn't think of a better family that sort of exuded the idea of uh, commitment to faith, commitment to community, and commitment to Baylor better than the Baileys. So as you see um, uh, the Bailey name for this lecture, I hope that you'll recognize, as I do, the, the great stewardship that they have for the community of Waco and the love that they did for Baylor. And uh, we're very grateful. So although they're not here, I think we should give a hand to the Bailey family. My dear colleague, Dr. Jason Witt, will introduce our speaker. It is my distinct honor to introduce our speaker for the fifth annual Bill and Roberta Bailey Family Lecture in Christian Ethics. James Davison Hunter is LeBras Levinson, Distinguished Professor of Religion, Culture, and Social Theory at the University of Virginia. He also serves as the Executive Director of the University's Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture. Additionally, I would be quite remiss should I fail, should I, if I failed to note that Dr. Hunter's connection to Baylor University. He is Distinguished Visiting Scholar in the Department of Sociology a distinction he has held since 2012. He is the author of nine books, three edited volumes, and numerous essays, both scholarly and popular. Among his books are The Death of Character, Moral Education in an Age Without Good or Evil, Is There a Culture War, 
a dialogue on values in American public life that was co-authored with Alan Wolf, and to change the world, the irony, tragedy, and possibility of Christianity in the late modern world. He is also the publisher of the journal The Hedgehog Review. In 2004, he was appointed by the White House to the National Council of the National Endowment for the Humanities. His current research project examines moral authority and science, and he is the principal investigator for the research project Character and Citizenship in 21st Century America, Studies in the Moral Ecology of Formation. Over the years, his research findings have been presented to audiences on National Public Radio and C-SPAN, at the National Endowment for the Arts, and at dozens of colleges and universities around the country, including Columbia, Harvard, Vanderbilt, Notre Dame, and the New School for Social Research. I read that directly off your web page, and I would say, and I only note that because there's an, something missing from that that I, I can edit for you if you need to. It's presented at Baylor University as well. I think we'd like to be included there. He's been a consultant to the White House, the Bicentennial Commission for the U.S. Constitution, the Pew Charitable Trust, and the National Commission on Civic Renewal. He is indeed one of America's most significant and most thoughtful public intellectuals. And yet, as many of you know all too well, a list of accomplishments and contributions, even one as impressive as this, never tells the full story. Dr. Hunter is a man of great generosity with his time. He is a kind and good man, one who has been a faithful supporter of the work of IFL and Baylor's mission. He's joined us at Baylor to meet with a faculty reading group on one of his texts. He's been part of Communio, a retreat for, fa for Baylor educators when we go to Laity Lodge. He's been the plenary speaker at the Baylor Symposium on Faith and Culture. In the work that we do here at IFL, we are privileged to meet and host scholars, intellectuals from across the country and around the world, those whose names are quite significant and whose work stands them apart from their colleagues. Dr. Hunter is one of that very small handful who I remember not only for the excellence of their scholarship and their contributions and presentations, but for his gracious demeanor, his thoughtfulness, his warmth, and his genuine friendliness. Even suggesting, even sending a suggested reading to a, what I will call a young associate director after a conversation in a long car ride, surprising by sending a book he had talked about. That's the kind of man he is. It's my honor to introduce him today for this lecture, Good Kids Thinking Anew About the Moral Formation of Children. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Hunter. And as I have to add, and still a disappointment to my mother. <laughs> Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Jason, um, for that incredibly warm uh, welcome and introduction. It is a pleasure to be here at, the, at, at Baylor, where I have found uh, friendship and extraordinary uh, intellectual stimulation. It has been a great association, and I'm, and I'm so very grateful for it. I also want to thank uh, the Bailey family um, for their generosity. Uh, the old Chinese saying, when you drink from the well, remember the well digger. Um, it is appropriate to remember them um, and to thank them for their, for their generosity. It is an honor to give the Bill and Roberta Bailey family lecture in Christian ethics this afternoon. The generosity of the invitation to give this lecture is reflected in the fact that I'm not an ethicist and therefore definitively unqualified to give this lecture. Yet the capaciousness of Darren's vision for this series is rooted in the recognition that the questions posed within a lived ethics, and especially a lived Christian ethics, are never merely academic. They're never merely academic abstractions but rather puzzles bounded by the chaotic particularities of time and place and circumstance. The grubby realities of history and society provide the context for ethics, and the context matters decisively. 
It is this insight that provides the loose justification for inviting someone like myself. I'm a historical and cultural sociologist, mainly interested in questions of meaning and moral order in contemporary life. And as abstract as that phrase may sound, meaning and moral order in contemporary uh, society or contemporary life, the reality is that these questions of meaning and moral order play out in the most tangible ways, in fact, in ways that bear on the flourishing or the languishing of human life. They play out in our politics, our economic policies, our vision for education, our philanthropy, our faith communities. But there are few places where the questions of meaning and moral order play out more tangibly than in the formation of children where ethics is transmitted to coming generations. There's not a parent in this room. There's not a future parent in this room who is not worried or will be worried about how to raise good kids, of encouraging good ethical character. But this is no easy or straightforward task in a world like ours. This is why the focus of my talk is on the moral and ethical formation of children. Two quick caveats. The first is that uh, it was Nietzsche who said, Nietzsche, famous Christian ethicist, said <laughs> that scholarship um, is almost always a veiled form of autobiography. And so I'm going to do something um, um, that I don't usually do. I'm going to weave a bit of my own biography into this, this story. Um, not into the kind of larger sets of, of, of uh, projects that uh, I'm working on, um, but into this, this story itself and why I think it's, it's so important. I'm not going to tell stories about my kids, though. The other caveat um, has to do with the awkwardness of the subject itself, and in particular, the word character. I recognize that in certain parts of the country, certain communities. There is no awkwardness in talking about such things. Waco may be one of them, Texas may be one of them. But this is not the case in so many other places in the world. Precisely because we live in an increasingly pluralistic world, the question of character and its importance is simply no longer self-evident. Many have no idea what the word actually means. To others, the word feels old-fashioned. To still others, the word is politically freighted. Like many important ideas and concepts in the late modern world, the word has been emptied of meaning and is contested both in academic and in public discourse. It leaves us uncomfortable, and when we are uncomfortable with something, we tend to avoid it. But in a world like ours, we can't afford to ignore it or avoid it, however uncomfortable it makes us feel. But since our goal is not to foster yet another front of the culture war, let me suggest for the time being that we not debate the meaning of the word character. Character is a word that crystallizes the kind of, of, of work of moral formation. Let's not debate the meaning of character. It's a critically important debate to have, to be sure, but we need to begin at a place where I think we all find agreement. So I want to begin with what I believe is the shared recognition that our lives are absolutely permeated with moral and ethical evaluation. Who among us has not felt the enduring sting when trust has been violated, when promises have been broken? What person has not faced the guilt and shame of moral failure? Is there anyone who hasn't known the temptation to shade the truth or to lie outright when transparency could hurt our interests or ambitions? And what mother or father holding their newborn doesn't yearn for that child to live lives rich with meaning and purpose and contribution. Beyond our own experience, there are the issues we read about literally every single day, 
that often intersect our lives in personal ways, issues of sexuality, of sexual misconduct, of fairness in the workplace and corruption in the workplace, of wealth and of poverty, unemployment, immigration, crime and incarceration, and in our civic duties in the face of all of these issues. Yes, our lives individually and collectively are permeated with ethical uh, evaluation and significance. In that light and in the spirit of charity, I want to suggest that whatever else it might mean, character is a signifier. It's a signifier for how the self mediates ethical challenges that permeate everyday life. It's a signifier, I'll say it again, for how the self mediates the ethical challenges that permeate everyday life. It's not the end of the discussion, but in a time of confusion and disagreement, it is a start. If we can agree that normativity or ethical evaluation permeates life and culture, that there is no Switzerland in the realm of morals and ethics, and that character, at the least, is a way of talking about how we as individuals and communities engage the realities of a life in a way that is ethically serious, then the question is, how do we carry the weight of the moral challenges we face? How do we carry the weight of the moral challenges we face? What resources do we have to bear the moral burdens that permeate our personal and shared lives? And are those resources enough? Those, it seemed to me, are the central questions. I didn't understand it in these terms, of course, but this was essentially my coming-of-age question. I emerged from the happy fog of my youthful ignorance at the end of the war in Vietnam. My father had fought in the Pacific during World War II, and my uncle had been a spy behind enemy lines in Germany. Yet I couldn't shake the conviction that the war in Vietnam was different. Our civilization wasn't at stake. In fact, it wasn't clear what the war was about at all. My teenage rebellion took form in an endless argument with my father over the moral rightness of the war. Raised uh, in the Lutheran tradition, I read Kierkegaard and Barth and Bonhoeffer as a 15 and 16 year old looking for answers. And then I read Yoder, not a Lutheran, but a German, as a 16 and 17 year old, again, looking for answers. And my central question was, how could a Christian, how could anyone kill another creature made in God's image? So when we face dilemmas of a personal and political and morally fraught uh, as this, what, what is there to carry the weight of such a decision of what to do and the decision of what the consequences um, of that decision? Over the course of my years in college, I lost three very close friends, two to cancer and one to congenital heart failure. The last died in my arms as we rushed into the hospital in the back of a station wagon. How do we carry the weight of such loss? How do we bear the burden of such sorrow? And then I faced my own mortality as a young man in a hospital in another country far away from home, as doctors told me I had days to live if I didn't respond to the medicine they had been pumping into my veins. Out, out, brief candle. In the words of Macbeth, is life but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more? Is life really nothing more than a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing? How do we carry the weight of the meaning or meaninglessness of our lives. 
You can write down your own stories and write them into these questions. Yes, all of our lives and our entire world is filled with ethical significance and the question of character, of moral formation, is at the very least a question of how we face up to these challenges in ways that are morally serious. Whether or not people understand the word virtue or character, words like these, these questions matter, and they matter to everyone. And they matter profoundly and enduringly to the young. The sum and substance of my talk this afternoon revolves around the question, what provides the best account of moral and ethical formation for the young? What provides the best account of moral formation and ethical formation for the young? From there, it is the practical question. What are the resources available to us to help us cope with tragedy, loss, vulnerability? What are the resources that give us courage and hope? What are the resources that orient us toward justice and benevolence? I believe that our accounts today are too thin, and thus the resources available to children are also too thin. We need to thicken them, not in a way that returns us to the past. That would be impossible anyway. But in a way that is more adequate to the realities and challenges we face in the late modern world. To explain what I mean, I'd like to address three questions. First, I want to reflect a bit about where we are on this question of moral formation and resources and how we got here. Second, I want to talk through what I think might be wrong with where we are. And finally, I'd like to suggest where we need to go. The main point I want to make can be summarized in a parable. Imagine we had a passionate interest in apples. Apples are generally tasty to eat, healthy for the body, and beautiful to look at. And so convinced of the good they provide, we want to understand them and promote them. We want to know why an apple looks the way it does, why it tastes the way it does, how it grows, why some apples grow better and bigger and more flavorfully than others, and why some apples are misshapen and some just taste like cardboard. To this end, we study the apple, though usually in small batches and from a particular orchard that's nearby. We examine the skin of the apple and its flesh. We look at its chemistry, the physics of its size. We x-ray and do MRIs to peer inside the apple. We dissect it. And yet it never occurs to us to look at anything other than the apple itself. No one looks at the stem, the branches of the tree, the tree itself, or the orchard. No one looks at the composition of the soil, the nutrients in the soil, the amount of water the trees receive, or the amount of sunshine the trees are exposed to. It never occurs to anyone that healthy apples grow in and are dependent upon a healthy ecosystem. What am I driving at? This parable provides a fairly precise picture of the leading ways in America for thinking about, talking about, and practically seeking to cultivate the moral and character development of children, what are euphemistically called the non-cognitive dimensions of child development. So where are we? This picture derives from the diffusion of the conceptual models of secular psychology. This is a paradigm that has been in place for a century or so, since James held forth at Harvard and Dewey held forth at Columbia. And while fads and fashions have changed, while the language and techniques have changed over all this time, the fundamental assumptions and the underlying concepts have been relatively stable over the duration. This regime is highly individualistic. Its defining feature and center point is the autonomous self. It is also a regime that pervades all of the mainstream, of all mainstream institutions that mediate moral understanding to children, including churches. After all, James Dobson was a psychologist, is a psychologist and it permeates all of his books. 
There have been few alternatives to this uh, dominant model along the way. Think, for example, of the neoclassical um, uh, model advocated by Bill Bennett's Book of Virtue. Some of you might remember that. But the alternatives have tended to be more political than educational in nature. These, as these alternatives have been translated into actual pedagogy, practical pedagogy, what makes them distinctive tends to dissolve by virtue of their reliance upon psychology for its concepts, techniques, and ideals. How we got here wasn't inevitable. History is filled with contingencies, and so it is here. Like so much of American culture, a good starting point is the intellectual and culturally rich period of colonial New England. Moral education leading up to the founding of the New Republic was thoroughly Calvinist and carried principally by the family and local church. The educational mandate placed upon parents during the colonial period was typified by Cotton Mather's exhortation that children should be taught, and I quote, to remember four words and attempt the, all that is comprised in them, obedience, honesty, industry, and piety. Mather's simple advice was nothing out of the ordinary, even outside the Puritan community. The icon, that icon of modern thought, John Locke, a few decades before, advised much the same in his essay, Some Thoughts Concerning Education, published in 1693. This is Locke. This was a highly influential book, a 17th century equivalent to Benjamin Spock's Baby and Child Care. Locke insisted that the child's habits be shaped in accordance with the virtues of piety, loyalty, industry, and temperance. It's difficult today to imagine why religion was so central to parents and other moral guardians, but Locke himself articulated the reason. To the 17th century mind, there could be no morality without God. Virtue could not exist without reverence for God. Locke put it this way, as to the foundation of virtue, there ought very clearly to be imprinted on his, the child's mind, a true notion of God as the as of the independent supreme being, author and maker of all things, from whom we receive all our good, who loves us and gives us all things. This wasn't mere lip service. Like others, Locke encouraged levels of spiritual discipline unimaginable today, advising parents and masters to keep, and I quote again Locke, to keep children constantly, morning and evening, to acts of prayer and devotion to God, and to the memorization, perfectly by heart, of the Lord's Prayer, the Creeds, and the Ten Commandments. Needless to say, we've come a long way since the late 17th century. The urgency to form children morally and ethically hasn't diminished, in my view, uh, appreciably over these centuries. But how we think about and practice the ethical formation of children has changed fundamentally. The entire social and moral ecology of formation has been transformed. Now, there are many things that can be talked about here, but let me just highlight a couple of things. The content of moral instruction has changed from the objective moral truths of divine scripture and the laws of nature to the conventions of a democratic society to today, um, the subjective values of the individual person. The sources of moral authority have shifted from a transcendent God to the institutions of the natural order and the scientific paradigms that sustain them, now to the choices of subjects. The sanctions through which morality is validated have changed from the institutions and codes of the community to the sovereign choices of the autonomous individual. The primary institutional location through which moral understanding is mediated has also changed from the family and local uh, religious congregations and their youth organizations to the public school and popular culture. You get the picture. The entire social and moral ecology of moral formation has changed. 
Today's psychology is the leading paradigm for thinking about, talking about, and addressing the practical challenge of forming children ethically. When I use the word paradigm, I use it in the sense meant by Thomas Kuhn in his famous book, The Structures of Scientific Revolution. This is to say the assumptions, conceptual frameworks, exemplary figures, and experimental practices that underwrite what is considered the normal science of the day. A paradigm defines for a field what is reality, what is significant and insignificant, what are the relevant and irrelevant questions, what constitutes data and therefore needs to be observed, and what can safely be ignored. Think of it as the lens of a pair of glasses, lenses that let you focus on some things but filter out other things. Now, please don't get me wrong. This is not an attack on academic psychology. Academic psychology produces important work, and we need to see more of it. The problem is the uh, diffusion of this model and its hegemony over our understanding of these things. I'll come to the, some of those problems in just a minute. So why has psychology become dominant? The field has its own reasons, which are plausible, but I think the more compelling reasons are sociological and uh, political. The sociological reason for the dominance of psychology has to do with authority. With theology discredited as a public language, psychology has offered a seemingly neutral way to understand and cultivate the best qualities uh, of the human personality. It presents itself as a science. And after all, science we are inclined to believe is objective. It's fair, it's neutral. The political reason has to do with pluralism. Psychology seems inclusive and therefore less disruptive and less problematic on legal grounds. Indeed, when you study the history of moral and character formation in America, the enduring subtext has been a quest for an inclusive morality in the face of potentially rancorous um, uh, moral division a strategy of inclusion neutralizes the possibility of conflict for it means that no one's interests are neglected, no one is left out, and therefore no one is slighted, snubbed, or offended. An inclusive morality then is a safe morality. This provision, in my view, has become the unspoken imperative of all moral and character education today. On the face of it, that all sounds pretty good. What's the problem? Let me mention two, the problem of moral logic and the problem of moral agency. The problem of moral logic is that in the effort to establish a neutral and inclusive moral paradigm, the moral universe emptied of all the particularities that make it binding on the conscience and credible not to mention authoritative in a community. It might be a safe morality, but it has little or no traction. An inclusive morality tends to reduce morality to the thinnest of platitudes, severed from the social, historical, and cultural encumbrances that make it concrete and ultimately compelling. Let me give two very different kinds of examples, one concrete, the other uh, more philosophical. The first example of this, again, the problem of moral logic, of trying to be inclusive and emptying it of particularity, for those who remember, is Nancy Reagan's anti-drug campaign known as the state, by the statement, just say no. Because it was an assertion floating high above any argument or tradition or social practice, the trope, just say no, became a punchline in popular culture. Ultimately, evidence showed that the campaign had absolutely no effect. My second illustration is a bit more theoretical. It has to do with the value of empathy. Who's against empathy? It's inclusive, it's broad, it's universal. 
For many moral educators, it is our capacity to imagine ourselves in the situation of others that is the source of our moral sentiments. The pedagogic principle is that children learn from those with whom they are empathetic, the array of values that will constitute their moral universe. Even more, it is through our capacity to imagine the suffering of others, even those in circumstances that are utterly alien to us, that we learn compassion and mercy. In this, empathy becomes the foundation of an ethical life. Well, empathy indeed serves as an aid to understanding and a motive to enacting justice. But when it is decontextualized, when empathy is lifted out of the framework of embedded habits and moral traditions, empathy can be indiscriminate. Thus, in a materialistic and hedonistic culture, empathy may lead a child to experience nothing more significant than the anguish of another child who didn't receive all the Christmas presents she wanted, or the boy whose parents actually require him to do chores on Saturday morning when all of his friends are playing. Empathy on its own simply does not lead to consistent, enduring, or discriminating moral commitments. Indeed, it can lead to just the opposite. As Bernard Williams observed, empathy, and I quote, is a precondition not only of benevolence, but as Nietzsche pointed out, of cruelty as well. At the end of the day, we need to know why we should say no to drugs, why and to what we should give empathy. The denial of particularity so pervasive in the dominant uh, paradigm leaves us mute in response to the why questions behind all moral agency. Why should one be good? Why should one tell the truth rather than lie? Why should one shun cruelty in favor of compassion? Why should one pursue fairness for others when one's own interests are not served? Why should one care for those in need when everyone else around is indifferent? These are natural questions to ask, and not just by children. They point to the deep, long-standing questions at the foundation of moral philosophy. Far from abstract philosophical inquiry, these questions are implied every time we witness evil or cruelty or betrayal, and we ask, why did they commit such a horrid act? They arise just as often when we witness acts of great kindness or self-sacrifice and ask, where did such generosity come from? Let me move to the second problem. This same problem attends the how the paradigm understands people and children, not least, as moral agents. In this model, individuals are conceived as autonomous beings who live outside of history, outside of community, outside of the beliefs, rituals, and social practices of a community and outside the language and cultural ethos of a social world. A perfect illustration of this is Martin Luther King. King is often celebrated by many as the exemplar of the highest levels of justice. But never in any of the accounts of King do we find any reference to his southern heritage, his family and community, the theological traditions in which he was steeped, all of the particularities that made King, King, are stripped out of any account of who he was and what he accomplished. What you end up with is a mostly thin conceptualization of human subjectivity and agency, where human actions are really caused by the accidental byproducts of brain processes or impersonal psychological processes that are opaque to the agents themselves. In either case, agency is not entirely, but mostly an illusion, where human uh, reasoning is merely a post hoc form of rationalization. The unwitting effect is to position ethical content and moral agency within a social, historical, and cultural vacuum. The problem, in a nutshell, is that never before in history have there been generic values. And so far as I know, there has never been a person or child in history that lived its life outside of the particularities of a time, a place, a community, a social and political order, an ethos, and the like, outside of the influence of exemplars of right and wrong, 
justice, and injustice. Such people don't exist. Practically, then, the psychological strategy of character formation may be set up to affirm certain behaviors like altruism or empathy or kindness. By the same stroke, it may also be set up to oppose certain behaviors like the use of drugs or violence, sexual promiscuity, cheating or stealing. But there's nothing intrinsic to the strategy itself that leads to those ends. Likewise, the strategy may be set up to promote other behaviors, achievement, fidelity, compassion, tolerance, community. But there's nothing intrinsic to the strategy that leads to those ends. These moral ends are conceived as extensions of an autonomous self, and yet these ideals are themselves subordinate to the self, and often enough, its overriding moral purpose of self-actualization and fulfillment. As such, these moral ends are incapable of acting back upon selves and ordering their passions in any socially or politically coherent way. A moral code that is, at bottom, self-generating and self-referencing undermines the existence and adherence to a prevailing communal purpose. It precludes the possibility of any compelling collective discipline capable of regulating social life. Simply put, there is nothing to which the self is obligated to submit. In the end, the connection between the autonomous and unencumbered self and these moral ends are not only arbitrary, but they are also without binding address. Further still, they lack any coherent social purposes. Any agreement one finds in public life is purely fortuitous. It isn't surprising, then, that the vast evaluation literature over the years doesn't provide encouraging news about the efficacy of the psychological paradigm. The impact of values clarification, Kohlbergian cognitive developmentalism, Maslowian self-esteem, and positive psychology have all been underwhelming. Perhaps this is, uh, explains why there has been a turn in the psychological paradigm away from prescriptive morality to instrumental morality a place where psychology really can offer important insights. On the face of it, it doesn't seem like a turn at all because the advocates continue to use the language of human flourishing, but what they really mean by it is utility and capacity. Yes, they speak the language of Aristotle, but what they actually deliver is Bentham and Mill. In this new turn, character becomes a means to the end of meritocratic success, rather than a moral good in and of itself. As Paul Tuff put it, character strengths don't come from their relationship to any particular system of ethics, but rather from their practical benefit, what you could actually gain by uh, practicing them, possessing and expressing them. Now this is fine as far as it goes, but it doesn't take us any further toward deepening the moral resources for children. In sum, in my view, there are design flaws in the leading paradigm of moral understanding and formation that are fairly comprehensive. Think of it like a rocket engine. No matter how much money one pours into the project, unless one gets the engineering right, the rocket will never get off the ground. Or a great new business idea, Unless one understands the need of the consumer, the nature of the market, the design of the product, the business will not likely turn a profit. No amount of money will make a difference. I'd like to suggest, though these are not great analogies, I'd like to suggest that the same is true with our efforts to cultivate a morally and ethical, ethical seriousness among children, namely character. Until we have a philosophical, conceptual, anthropological, and scientific account that is adequate to the challenges of forming children ethically, one that is adequate to the historical, sociological, and cultural realities of the late modern age, we are not likely to make any significant progress on this question. What we need is a new paradigm, and I mean new. 
We can't and wouldn't want to recover the old traditionalist model of cotton mather, which, as I, would, as I say, would be impossible anyway. And we need something far richer and thicker than the disembodied liberalism, liberal individualism of the psychological paradigm. We need a new paradigm, one that is at least more adequate to the realities of the moral life, adequate to the challenges of forming children ethically, adequate to the institutional and ethical complexities of our pluralistic, confusing, and often chaotic late modern world. Any alternative must begin with the recognition of three irreducible realities. The first one has to do with ethics, and none of this will be a surprise at this point. We humans and the moralities we live by are, by nature, particular in character. We humans are embedded within and defined by particularity. And thus to ignore that particularity is to deny ourselves and our neighbors their humanity. Moreover, to try to deny these particularities leaves us without the social, moral, and institutional resources to face the ethical challenges of our lives and our moment uh, in, in this moment of history. Any alternative then must first recognize, account for, and work within the irreducible messiness of these particularities. A second irreducible reality is that human beings are inextricably formed within the social environment of particular communities and the cultures that define them and by which they live. Character, virtue, culture, and community are all of a fabric with each other. There are now there are always statistical anomalies, but as a rule, it is difficult, perhaps impossible, to have good character, to develop virtue in kids without good communities, virtuous communities, that give expression through its ideals and social practices to a good and healthy culture. The social and moral ecology of character, then, is irreducibly important. In short, any alternative must also begin from the premise that there is more to the apple than the apple itself. That to understand apples, how they grow, what makes a sweet tasting apple from one that tastes terrible, and so on, one must understand as much as one can about the tree, about the soil that nourishes the roots of the tree, about the different climates that affect rainfall, sunshine, prevalence of bugs, insects, and other pests. You get the picture. The fact is, some ecosystems are healthy and flourishing, others are ravaged by drought, by acid rain, by infestation, and all of these factors matter. The fact is that children are raised in families in a wide array of linguistic, ethnic, moral, and religious communities. Those communities are distinguished by different social practices and different institutions, and by virtue of being in history, they also have different collective memories, different heroes, different villains. To try to understand, much less encourage ethical formation in children without understanding these particularities cannot but fail to achieve uh, its ends. But now there is a third irreducible reality in our chaotic, dangerous, and ever-promising world, and that is the problem of difference and of moral difference in particular. You can see that all three of these are overlapping. But here I want to emphasize the problem of difference as a political problem. In our public rhetoric, we say that dif diversity is not just a social reality, but a political ideal, a given of social life, and an aspiration of public justice in a democratic polity, e pluribus unum. Nowhere has the rhetoric of diversity been more enthusiastically received than in the realm of education. And yet when it comes to the moral life, our educational philosophies and policies aggressively contradict the ideals and policies promoting diversity. We actually fear diversity of this deeply normative kind and therefore do all in our power to domesticate the troubling particularities of moral commitment and community. 
Any alternative paradigm then must provide a new approach to the social and political challenge of, achieve, of achieving inclusivity in the face of our differences. This is the challenge of our post-secular moment. For me, this would mean that instead of forcing commonality in our moral discourse at the expense of particularity, we would discover commonality through our particularity. As I've argued before, the humanist, the Jew, and the Christian who join in condemnation of racism will certainly differ over whether the humanist, Jewish, and Christian convictions provide the most trustworthy reasons for their agreement. Yet each provides thick moral arguments that preserve the most important commitments of the other. We will most certainly discover other moral agreements about integrity, fairness, altruism, responsibility, respect, valor, agreements that are too numerous to mention. But these agreements will be found within moral diversity, not in spite of them. Where disagreements remain, they can be addressed through a substantive engagement that enhances rather than undermines democracy. My main point is that we pursue democratic alternatives that recognize differences in moral culture and commitment as a matter of polity, but in ways that neither weaken nor violate democratic principles of non-discrimination and non-repression. Easier said than done. Creating space in this way for different moral communities to flourish in public and private life might very well lead to conditions that are conducive to the growth of people, of ethical seriousness, and very possibly good character. Let me conclude. I was 25, just finished my graduate work. I went to India for three months and lived, shall we say, on the cheap. It's also safe to say that um, I was no longer in the ivory tower and far, far away from the safe, comfortable upper middle class bubble I had grown up in. There, I witnessed, like those of you who have been there, poverty, hunger, disease, and basic physical need I had heard about but never really had imagined. It wasn't just the plain, out in the open assertiveness of this need. It was the overwhelming reach of this need. It was ubiquitous. How does one make sense of this privation? And it wasn't merely physical. In Varanasi, I stood near a boy as he lit the fire of his mother's funeral pier, and together we watched her body consumed. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. What can carry the weight of such sadness? But I also stayed in Calcutta visiting the missionaries of charity. And of those who have been know, the convent is an island of simplicity, cleanliness, order, and beauty, and one of the dirtiest, most poverty-stricken areas of the world. What could bear the weight of such beauty, of such sacrifice, of such hope? Through the day I spent with Mother Teresa, I couldn't take my eyes off of her gnarled, arthritic hands, her feet deformed by severe bunions, and the topography of her wrinkled face as she went person to person, feeding, comforting, encouraging knowing she was in pain, but knowing too that her sacrifice was animated by an ache that nothing in this world can satisfy. Mother Teresa made a strong impression. I learned a lot from my brief time with her. Whatever it is that can bear the weight of our tragedies and aspirations, our disappointments, our failures and guilt, as well as our hopes and our yearnings, Whatever it is that can bear the moral burdens that permeate our personal and our shared lives, it will not be found in the mostly empty and mostly sterile abstractions of disembodied reason. But it will be found in communities where prudence, wisdom, faith, courage, hope, justice, and love are, however imperfectly, modeled by everyday exemplars and woven into the practices that define their everyday life. 
It is in such communities, and only in such communities, where good kids will be formed. At its best, the Christian community is such a community. We know, of course, that it often isn't. But for those who seek it, they will find in the Christian faith the resources to build communities of character, to use Stanley Hauerwas's phrase, communities of character within the wreckage of the late modern world. Everything else will follow, including the formation of children morally and ethically equipped to face the daunting challenges of the world they inherited. Thank you. This is the best part, so I don't want to miss this. Uh, yeah. This is always the, the most fun, so. And if you have a question, come on. I want to thank you for uh, this perspective that you provided for us. And uh, I suppose, uh, in, in a way, it's embedded in your answer, but I wonder if you would say a bit more about how one avoids uh, the dangers of, of particularities gone astray. Right. I think that's, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, there's... So I, I, I will uh, say something I hadn't, didn't say in the introduction. Um, we're involved in this multi-year massive project um, on character and citizen uh, f uh, formation at the Institute um, uh, for Advanced Studies and Culture. Um, it, it is, in fact, the largest study ever done on the subject, period. We have done um, years of ethnographic work in multiple school sectors. Um, we've just, we're in the process of finishing up a survey that will have you know, close to 7,000 subjects. Um, we're doing in-depth interviews. It's just, it's an extraordinary body of research um, that I have the great pl pleasure, privilege of trying to synthesize. Um, and one of the things, we've now finished the ethnographic work. Um, we've looked at, um, we've sent ethnographers into Jewish schools, Catholic schools, classical Christian schools, public charters, pu urban public, rural public schools, um, Islamic schools. Um, you know, and getting into these schools was not a, you know, it was a hard thing to do, but, um, and these are schools around the country. But um, one of the things that we're finding is that there is a tension within education and, um, and within the model as we're seeing it play out empirically. It's a tension that's modeled, that, 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 that plays out politically as well. And that's the tension between thick and thin. Now, um, Something like Islamic fundamentalism would be a really thick culture, right? Um, and uh, it has all sorts of strengths, um, and, and I don't mean that um, in, in terms of its vision of human flourishing, but in terms of what, uh, as a vision, what it animates for those who follow it. Um, the problem with the late modern world is that it tends to be too thin. So in in a democratic, a modern democratic polity, and again, this is, a, this is about sort of adapting um, our model to the realities of our, of our time and, and to our political and social circumstances, is to recognize that we live in a liberal democracy um, with, that has all sorts of challenges, but it is, it is one that tends to deny those encumbrances that are prior to choice. So, um, you know, ultimately it's about finding the balance um, between thick and thin. And, and I think in the public schools, the strategy is going to be about trying to thicken, provide greater resources. You're not going to be able to do in public schools what you can do in a classical Christian school or in a Catholic school, right? You're just not going to be able to do that. And in some of these schools, of course, it may be about thinning them some because it is about living together with our deepest differences. So um, 
there's, there's an educational and a political issue that has to be addressed at the same time. And, um, and they have to be worked out in tension, and there's no obvious recipe for this. But what is clear is that the late modern world, I mean, in, in its consumerism, in its individualism, in its use of technology, entertainment, it, it, it all contributes to that thinness of our culture. Um, the dominant models of psychology reinforce that. What we're saying is we need to, to figure out ways to push back against that. So. Thank you very much. Um, following on that, that question, why should we think that, uh, I mean, it, that beautiful picture that you gave at the end about these communities of character that instantiate these virtues, those are almost by definition thick. Uh, right. There will be some uh, disagreement about what constitutes faith and what constitutes hope and what constitutes generosity in those matters. But there is no chance of a moral formation of children on thin models of generosity or hope or, uh, or love or self-sacrifice in right. these ways. Uh, why, um, why can't we simply say that um, uh, consumerism is deadly and um, the kinds of choices that our liberal democracy wants to promote are precisely the kinds of choices which in fact are diminishing the capacity for the moral formation uh, of children. I think we can say that. I think there are a lot of communities that want to say that. I believe there are a lot of educators who see that um, as a kind of liquid Drano for the on the, um, on the kids that they're, they're trying to, to, to teach. Um, so I think there's actually a, a, a fair amount of agreement about what's wrong, but what do we offer? Grit. Grit isn't a virtue. Grit is a capacity. And it's a capacity without any kind of coherent teleology, right? Pol Pot had grit. Well, he did. And the drug dealers in The Wire had grit. So that, that's part of the problem of lifting out even something like grit, which is not a virtue, but a capacity. Now, it might be associated with persistence, you know, th things like that. But, but again, lift it out of anything else. It, it just leads to nihilism. Yeah, so I think we can agree on some of the problems. Um, I think we need further education into to what some of the other problems are. But 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 um, but I also believe, in, in the, as in the case of, of racism, you know, we can teach kids that that to discriminate against uh, another human being by virtue of their race or ethnicity or gender, or, you know. Or, sexuality, that in our polity, in our democracy, this is against the law, you know? And, and that's, these are the rules we have to play in. Well, on what basis do we support opposition to racism you know, or sexism, something like that? Well, it's, um, there are gonna be people in a classroom, a public school, for example, who are coming from a Jewish background and a Muslim background and a humanistic background. Let's see if we can draw on some of those resources. That's it. No, no, I'm, no we can keep going. I just. Yeah, well, Larry, did you have, or Perry? I just didn't have anything more intelligent to say to you. So. Okay. I didn't. When you said that's it, I wasn't no, no, sure no. what that no. did say. Lots are still right. with you. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask you uh, sort of the policy implications of this. It would seem that you might favor school choice vouchers or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I too at times have been attracted by a model, certainly in the Netherlands it seems like it's an equity yeah, yeah, sure. sort of system. But I'm always struck by, I had a Dutch student do this graduate paper on mission statements of uh, Christian schools in the Netherlands and then uh, Christian schools here in the States and she was doing some comparison. And what was striking was how the Dutch schools had lost, because they're trying to recruit all kinds of students largely, but for other reasons, lost much of their particularity. Yeah, I think that's right. And uh, 
of course, then the ones here that were private had not. They were the thick types of uh, schools you're talking about, especially theologically. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder if you would uh, say more about uh, what you think in terms of school choice. Well, two points in, in response. One is that I think as a matter of public justice, we need to offer in education what we offer already in faith and politics, which is choice. That just seems to me a matter of public justice. Um, on, on the issue of the, the Dutch um, case, um, I, I was schooled in, in classical social theory and in Weber not least, um, and, and part of the inheritance of Weber is always be aware of the unintended consequences of even the best actions. This is why I was always so nervous about the faith-based initiatives of, of President Bush um, and, and Clinton and others who, who promoted that. Um, the unintended consequence is, is the secularization of the very institutions they're trying to draw the moral, moral uh, sources and other kinds of resources from. Um, no one was thinking about those unintended, not many people to my knowledge, were thinking about those unintended consequences. But, and I don't think that they were thought about um, in the early part of the 20th century when that pluralistic model was being uh, designed and implemented in, in the Netherlands. So. Hi, Larry. Right, final, yeah, sure. Final question. So, all ways of, of living have pluses and minuses, and we can talk about the abuses of particularism versus secularism. And, but wouldn't we probably agree in, say, Western Europe, North America, that modern secularism has delivered more human flourishing than other arrangements and conditions anywhere else and at other times? Or would we not agree? I think it, everything hinges on what you mean by secularism. And for this, we could turn to Charles Taylor's masterful work, um, uh, Secular Age. Um, I, I wouldn't use the word secularism. I, I would use the word enlightenment. Um, but you know, my reading of the Enlightenment was that it was a rewriting of the Jewish and Christian traditions into a secular language. Um, and partly because of the way it was articulated, the way it, it um, became embedded in our public language, um, issues of natural law, or God and nature's God, and you know, the language of Jefferson and Adams, the tensions that they experienced, allows has allowed people over the centuries to read themselves into it. So even conservative fundamentalist Christians, conservative Catholics, you know, for whom the magisterium um, um, uh, uh, the Pope and, and, and the like, you know, at least in the early part of the 20th century was viewed as undemocratic. Nevertheless, we're able to read themselves into this experiment. Um, I think what we're seeing now is a turn. I think we're not only, I mean, we, we've, in my opinion, we have been in a post-Christian moment for quite some time. I think we're in a post-liberal moment. I think that's, that's the nature of our moment right now. Um, my view is that conservative Christians will look back at the secular humanists with nostalgia, because at least they were humanists, okay? Um, or at least aspiring to be. You know, that's a kind of polemical point. Um, but it's, it's um, I think that there is a new kind of, of, uh, of, of naturalism, a new kind of secularism that is utterly disenchanted. We're seeing that within um, um, uh, certain um, philosophical discourses. Uh, Darren mentioned this new book um, uh, that will be coming out in August. Uh, it's called Science and the Good. And, um, and what animates um, the, the new moral science is, it just, is, is a disenchanted naturalism that, um, that at the end of the day is, is, is nihilistic. And it's partly because it's, it's like I say, it, it, it uses the language of an older enlightenment. It uses the, 
but in fact what it delivers is not just Bentham and Mill, it's, it's, it's Nietzsche. And there's an argument that you'll have to read about. 23 fighting, yeah, whatever. So, so anyway, yeah, I, 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 um, let me just make one other comment here. I think, you know, this was part of the story of, of Dewey um, and of James. I think both of them um, <clears throat> were um, operating within um, a culture in which to use the sociological language that I know you know well. Um, uh, they were embedded within a habitus um, um, of moral understanding that they never imagined would disintegrate. So ideas about experimentalism in educational philosophy, fine, it's great to experiment as long as there are unspoken assumptions that remain stable. But what happens when those unspoken assumptions about trust, about the good, about sacrifice and so on are no longer there? Then experimentalism becomes chaotic. That's the moment I think we are witnessing. This is why I think Nietzsche was right. He was the post uh, posthumous philosopher. He said he would, he would not be understood until 100 years after his death. Well, it's been 119 years. And I think we're, we're not just seeing it in the academy. Um, I think we're seeing it played out dramatically in our politics today uh, uh, and, and elsewhere too. So, so the issue of secularism, it's not stable. It's not a stable category. And how we understand that um, makes all the difference, I think. In, so why don't we, do, why don't we call join, that? Join me in thanking James okay. Hunter. Thank you.